Leslie Dean High was born in Bristow, Iowa on February 12, 1924. He was raised during the Depression with small town Midwestern values and a loving family. His father, the owner of the local hardware store, taught him by example the value of hard work, honesty, and compassion for your neighbors. He had a happy childhood, and one of his favorite expressions has always been, I'm a happy guy. Les recalled that even during the Depression, his family was happy and always had enough to eat in the farmlands of Iowa, where food was available to barter for other needs, such as hardware from the John High Hardware Store. Les learned to love bread and milk, crackers and milk, some of the simple pleasures he enjoyed his entire life. Les worked small jobs even as a boy. He was a good student and loved to learn. At times he offered to work for free so he could learn how to do a task. He even washed farmers' airplanes for an occasional ride and he washed the gas station owner's truck in exchange for gas when he was older. His formative years made Les very frugal and led him to be a good steward of resources his entire life. Les discovered girls and love at first sight when he saw Carol Cooper for the first time. Carol lived in Morrison, a short drive from Grundy Center, where Les lived. Before her sophomore year of high school, Carol decided to change schools to Grundy Center High School, where she became a classmate with Les. In May of that school year, Carol recalled a class picnic where she invited herself to join Les, who was sitting at a table by himself and eating a fine lunch his mother had packed for him. Les recalls thinking, how could I get so lucky? The two dated during their high school years and soon became inseparable. They went to both the junior and senior high school proms together. Les knew immediately, and Carol soon realized they were soulmates. After high school, Carol went to nursing school. And in September of 1941, Les went to college at Iowa State to study civil engineering. He also joined the Army ROTC, Reserve Officer Training Corps, and the associated V-5 Naval Aviation Cadet Program for the training and development of Navy pilots. A couple of months later, everything changed. As Carol recorded in her memoirs, after the terrible December 7, 1941, in Pearl Harbor, Les came to Cedar Rapids around Christmas to tell me he and his friend Jake Broderick were going to join the Marines. Sometime later, Les told me his dad wouldn't sign for him to enlist since Les was just 17 years old. Les's dad said Les could go into any military service as long as it was an officer program. Jake went into the Marine Corps as a member of Carlson's Raiders, he was in heavy battles and was awarded the Navy Cross and two Purple Hearts. Les paid for college by working several jobs, including one in a girls' dormitory dinner hall where he worked in exchange for food. Shortly after he started, he became the head waiter and had a role in selecting and supervising the other workers. It was a popular job for the boys because of food rationing during the war. But Les only kept the guys who would do the work. Even at this early stage, he was dedicated to being responsible and he encouraged the same level of excellence from others. Les stayed busy with his studies, his jobs, and writing letters to Carol. As Carol recalled, He wrote letters to me quite often, sometimes daily, special delivery on Sundays. Les was inspired by the service of his friend Jake. His father, who served in the Navy during World War I, and his older brother, who served in the Army in World War II. After that war began, Les applied to both the U.S. Naval Academy and the U.S. Coast Guard Academy. In the spring of 1943, like many of his peers in the greatest generation, Les was called to active duty by the Navy. He moved to a Navy barracks at Iowa State as a Navy seaman. That lasted for just a few weeks because he was soon accepted into the Coast Guard Academy. So after two years of college, Les set off for New London, Connecticut 
in June of 1943 with his dad's proud blessing. Les liked the idea of learning to be in charge, but he always kept with him the respect he had for the role of all service members, like his father, brother, and good friend Jake. With those values as a foundation, Les I entered the Coast Guard Academy as a member of the class of 1947. But since the program was accelerated for World War II, he graduated in 1946. In the meantime, Carol attended three years of nursing school and was ultimately stationed in New London, where she and Les could be together on weekends. Les loved his time at the Academy. He got good grades, which he attributed to having already had two years of college. After having worked very hard to afford and then stay in college, he felt blessed to be at the Academy, where all he had to do was square a few corners, follow some rules, and actually get some sleep at night. Given his self-discipline, he did very well in the military training. He always followed the rules carefully to make sure he would never be restricted and unable to spend liberty time with Carol. His yearbook said he was known as Happy Hig, that he took orders from one of the tiniest nurses in the world, Carol, of course, and that he mixes milk and soup with pounds of crackers and bread. Les married Carol the day he graduated from the academy, and then they started their military life together. Les began his career with two short assignments afloat, as deck watch officer for the Coast Guard cutters Taney and Akushnet. This is where he learned the value of a good chief and a dedicated crew. He was also fortunate to be mentored by a young officer named Owen Seiler, who later became a Coast Guard aviator and ultimately the Commandant of the Coast Guard. While Les was at sea in the North Atlantic, Carol returned home to Iowa to give birth to their first son in 1947. After two years aboard ship, Les got orders to his first command as commanding officer of Coast Guard Loran Station, Kowajalein, in the South Pacific. Carol again returned to Iowa and welcomed their second son to the world in 1948. While in command, Les learned to have confidence in his leadership abilities as he was the only officer around in that isolated duty assignment. He also had plenty of time to write letters to Carol, sometimes several a day, and to think about his career. Based on his interest in flying, since his early days washing planes and designing and building airplane models, as well as his indoctrination into the Navy V-5 program and his discussions with Owen Seiler, Les applied for the opportunity to go to flight school. Fortunately, after some logistical challenges of getting a flight physical while on isolated duty, Les was assigned to attend basic flight training at Pensacola and advanced training at Corpus Christi. Les flew both helicopters and fixed-wing aircraft. Every model the Coast Guard had except the C-130 and the B-17. En route to his first flight duty station in San Diego, Les took Carol back to Iowa once again for the birth of a son number three in 1951. Les had three great years and as many flight hours as he could get in San Diego. After too many hour-long commutes between the air station and their rented home in the East County of San Diego, Les and Carol spent their entire savings to buy their very first home in Point Loma, five minutes away from the air station. After that, Les was often the first one on call whenever a pilot was needed. And as a non-drinker, he was always available day or night. Carol, of course, took care of the growing family so Les could get those valuable flight hours. After sunny Southern California, Les packed up the growing family and moved to Air Detachment Kodiak, Alaska, before it was a state. At Kodiak, Les flew many search and rescue missions and logistics flights. At one point, he was tasked to bring in a new aircraft type that he had flown in San Diego. 
He enjoyed helping to get the other pilots trained. Less than a year later, because of his fine work on a collateral duty assignment, he was recruited by a prospective CO to move with him to Air Station Traverse City, Michigan. In Traverse City, Les had more time on his hands than he had had in previous assignments. It was the only time in his career that he worked a, quote, normal, unquote, workday, and he got to spend more time with his growing family. He even taught himself to play golf while Carol and the boys walked along and picked cherries right from the trees that lined the course. In fact, he became so proficient at the game that he won the Traverse City President's Cup Golf Tournament on the day Carol gave birth to their first daughter in 1956. The baby was born very early in the morning and Les celebrated by winning the tournament later in the day while mother and baby slept at the hospital. As Les thought about his career and what he had learned about leadership, he began to request assignments back to the academy where he could have the opportunity to help educate its future leaders. Fortunately for the family though, he was forced to take an overseas, quote, hardship, unquote, tour to Air Station Bermuda first. While he was there, he flew seaplanes and had the distinction of flying both the PBY and the P-5M aircraft on their final flights back to the United States before they were taken to mothball status. After Bermuda, Les finally got his chance to go back to the Academy to fill the vacant Captain Commander Aviation billet as a Lieutenant Commander. In this role, he was the Academy Staff Aviator, and he ran the Cadet Aviation Indoctrination Program at Elizabeth City, North Carolina. This was normally a detached duty assignment for the summer, but in 1961, Les rented a small house for the entire family so he could be home when Carol gave birth to their fifth child and second daughter. Les enjoyed his years at the Academy, first as an instructor of navigation and then as assistant commandant of cadets. But he was most honored to be selected by the class of 1965 as their class advisor. Like every other job he ever had, he put all of his energies into this collateral assignment, helping shape these future leaders. At the same time, he and Carol were raising three teenage boys and two young girls at home. It became clear to Les and others that his subspecialty should be training and education. After the Academy graduation in 1965, Les headed to his next command as officer in charge of the Basic Operational Training Unit, or BOTU, for pilot training in Savannah, Georgia. Later, he also became the commanding officer of Air Station Savannah. As the holidays approached that year, Les decided that he should write a letter to each member of the Academy class of 1965 to see how they were doing. After just one short year in Savannah, he was selected to be the project officer for the establishment of a new air training center in Mobile, Alabama. Les poured himself into this major development project, bringing it in under budget and ahead of schedule. He was recognized for his accomplishment by being assigned as the executive officer of this major new command. The pace of the Mobile assignment was hectic, but around Thanksgiving, Les decided again to write letters to his class. Thus began his now famous annual project of writing holiday letters to every member of the class. The project got more complicated after that as the class members got new orders. Part of the project's evolution was the development of, quote, Les High's List, unquote. This was an address list that included names and addresses and later phone numbers and email addresses of all the members of the class and their wives. Les updated his list each year and sent it with his annual letter to help the former cadets stay in touch with each other as they progressed through their careers, whether in or out of the Coast Guard. From Mobile, Les was given another command, this time as CO of Air Station Detroit. 
Then he went on to the National War College, where he also elected to earn a concurrent master's degree. His payback tour was to Coast Guard headquarters as the chief of training and procurement. This is where Les pushed for Coast Guard specific in-house aviation standardization training, and he recruited the best to put that together for the Coast Guard. He also went out with the help of the planning staff to get a former Army center in Petaluma, California as a new training center. This was the only time in his career that Les ever carpooled to work, mainly with his two older sons who were Coast Guard junior officers at the time. The sons quickly learned that there was no, quote, normal workday. You went home when the job was done. In his final tour, Les was again in command, this time as the commanding officer of Coast Guard Reserve Training Center, or ROTC, Yorktown. While he was there, he spoke to every class that convened, giving them all a little lesson on leadership, a short course in human relations. I admit I made a mistake. You did a good job. Five, most important. What is your opinion? Four, most important. And if you please, thank you is the two most important words. And, and I, least most important word, and we is the most important word. I'm kind of a surprise I could remember all that. It was also at this command where Les earned his most prized accolade, the Jarvis Award, a Navy League Award for Leadership. What made it most special for him was that he was nominated for the award by his staff and crew. Les retired from the Coast Guard in 1975, but he never retired from his passion for leadership and mentoring. For well over 50 years, he continued his annual project of writing personal letters to every member of the Coast Guard Academy class of 1965 in time for the holidays. He shared his advice whenever he was asked and often when he wasn't. Even at age 98, when his eyesight began to fail him, he continued staying in touch each year with a generic letter and personal phone calls. Likewise, through the years, he kept in touch with many others he had served with during his Coast Guard career. These included secretaries, often on National Secretary's Day, stewards, mess chiefs, and academy classmates. The same year Les retired from the Coast Guard, he began law school. Les had always been interested in the law, and he wanted an activity to keep him busy as he transitioned away from Coast Guard active duty. After finishing law school and passing the bar exam on his first try, he did some legal work for a short time, working in the law office of a member of his beloved class of 65, who had a chance to return the favor by mentoring Les in his new profession. He also helped one of his law school classmates set up a legal practice. That classmate also became his son-in-law by marrying his oldest daughter. Unfortunately, Les found that the adversarial nature of many legal proceedings was not consistent with his values of fairness, justice for all, and problem solving. So he soon retired a second time. A very short time later, Numerous grandchildren began to arrive, many of whom lived just a mile away for Les and Carol to enjoy. While Carol was often found at all the grandkids' school and sporting events, Les, also known as Grandpa, became known as the best baby rocker in the family. He decided that the family activities were much more fulfilling than the legal work. Les kept himself busy, still reading the law, taking Carol to plays and musicals, reading and collecting books, and experimenting with computers. He also participated as a control subject in an Alzheimer's study, which he continued to do for over 35 years. Ironically, his participation in the Alzheimer's study helped prepare him for his last act of devotion as a caregiver to his beloved Carol, who passed away from Alzheimer's disease in 2012, after six years of illness. 
Although he was retired from the Coast Guard, ultimately for more years than he was on active duty, Les always maintained his interest in the service. Of course, he had all his contacts with the class of 65, but he also kept up the speed through weekly telephone calls with one of his sons who made a career in the Coast Guard serving in headquarters. Through the years, Les had a chance to meet with many senior leaders at various events in San Diego, Washington, D.C., and New London, Connecticut. When he did, he was never bashful about telling them what he thought they were doing right, always acting the mentor, even when unsolicited. Les enjoyed several Coast Guard events in retirement that allowed him to personally interact with his friends. Coast Guard Academy homecoming events for both his class of 47 and the class of 65, to which he was always invited, were always high on his list of favorites. He also really enjoyed an event celebrating the 100-year anniversary of Coast Guard Aviation and the 50th anniversary of the establishment of the Mobile Air Station and Aviation Training Center. Partly because of his role as project officer in establishing that unit, Les was inducted into the Coast Guard Aviation Hall of Honor. In his acceptance speech, he humbly stated that throughout his career, and then every time I got a job, I had people that were working with me seem to be wanting to make the Coast Guard so much better. And that last time, it was some credit. And I just got credit, credit, and credit. And it was all because of the Coast Guard people. He specifically mentioned and recognized several individuals who worked with him and made him look good. The only person or thing more important to Les than his service to others was his love for Carol. He knew this from the moment he met her. He married her the first day he could upon graduation from the Coast Guard Academy. Although he was often away from her on ships or isolated duty in his early career, he wrote to her almost every day. Upon retirement, he and Carol moved to San Diego, most importantly for health reasons for Carol. In their early 60s, when Carol suggested it, Les and she began daily walks, which continued even when Carol was wheelchair bound due to Alzheimer's disease. After Carol's death, Les acknowledged to anyone who would listen that Carol was the major influence on his life. In his view, Carol taught him the values of compassion, empathy, and love of family and friends. One of the best indicators of some of these values was Les's interest and skill in crafting obituaries of those close to him. Of course, his comments on Carol were most poignant, but there have been many others, including his Coast Guard friends, classmates, and members of the class of 65 who were honored by the wonderful reflections of Les High. Survivors always appreciated his loving words. As Les continued his daily walks, even into his late 90s, he became famous in the neighborhood. Whenever he was stopped by a neighbor who was amazed by his years of stamina and dedication to his walking routine, he often responded by giving credit to Carol. Then, as often as not, Les would tell his neighbor one or more of his many jokes, because, as he always said, Les High is a happy guy. How do you make holy water? Yeah. You just boil the hell out of it. And <laughs> that's, that's pretty good, though.